Hey Mason, you seem to recognize this band that we're reviewing today. Tell us about that. Yeah, I've, I've been pretty familiar with their stuff. So, if you okay, so today uh, what we're gonna talk about is this uh, grunge band, which is a huge grunge legend uh, that's been around for about about 20 years now, I guess. 20, 30 years, I'm not sure. Um, they were this band that used to they do a lot of grunge nowadays. You kind of a bit more diverse when it comes to their tone. And they're you still garbage. <laughs> you you might have heard of them. You know, they're they're I mean they're one of the big four of the grunge, next to bands like Nirvana, Soundgarden, and uh, Alice in Chains. And there's a good reason and why. I, no, there's not a good reason why you would compare such a such an awful band to something like Nirvana. Or because you can you can already tell that there's going to be two juxtaposing opinions on this band. Mason really loves this band. I really don't. And don't get me wrong, I love grunge bands. Soundgarden is one of my favorite bands of all time. I love Nirvana. This music, it's bad. It, there, there, there's, I can see why people like it, but I can't see myself enjoying this. Like it's not, it's it's not something I would put in in like the car. Like, oh yeah, let's listen to Germ, you guys. Come on, let, let, let's listen. What to is there, God, Kyle? One of their songs is called "Rear View Mirror." How is it not good for a car? Okay, okay. You can, How is it not good you, for a car ride? You got me there. You got me there, Chief. So, let's just get into it, and Mason's gonna do a lot of the talking, because I don't really like this band. I still listen to all their music, though, so you can't tell me, oh, you don't, don't judge it till you try it. Ugh, ugh, bitch, I have tried it. I'm getting heartburn right now, so let's Wait, jump you are? in. Alright, so, 1991's 10. This was their full-on debut album. And my least favorite album that they ever made. And... When this album came out, uh, my god, it, it, did this album blow up, you know? And the reason why a lot of people say that this is the best album is mainly because of how, like, over the top it se seems to sound. And most of their songs, like, uh, for example, the track Alive, which is very, this, uh, this over the top, very high and uplifting song. Even though it's about incest, I'm not even joking about that. Um, it's, it's basically about and this guy who's about like very young. You know, he thought it's he thought that his dad was his real dad, and I think you know where this is going. And his mom's like, you know what? That wasn't your real dad. Your real dad is dead. Have have a nice have a nice life, son. You won't get like <laughs> your life isn't broken or anything now. And so uh, the mom just kind of grieves and stuff, and she kind of starts to, like, seduce her son because she's raving over her husband. That's effed up. That's something I've seen in a hentai. I know, but it just sounds so, like, uh, very accessible, you know? Despite the subject matter. This is one I've seen on... I think I've seen this one on Hentai Haven. Or another uh, song where it talks about homelessness, which is um, Even Flow, where it talks about how the economy is kind of has this really thick line of just between, like, the very rich people and the very poor people, you know, it just describes somebody that just lives on the streets no matter what. Either suck or get sucked. Yeah. And there's a lot of, like, social commentary on this uh, album. And I do really enjoy this album, but I kind of wonder why you don't enjoy this album, because you're gonna have to defend yourself, okay? So, the album starts out with once. Now, I'm really like, wow. What an underwhelming song, because it's so mellow in comparison to the rest of the songs in the album. And I then, wouldn't really call it mellow. I would, I would more call release to be more mellow than Garden. And then you move on to Even Flow, which is like... It's... The lead singer doesn't know how to not do that one voice that Kurt Cobain did, but... Kurt how does Com Kurt Cobain sound like Eddie Vedder? But they both do that grunge lisp. You know the one. The one that kind of sounds like a country accent, but isn't, and is... is. I don't think Kurt like Cobain sounds country-like at all, to be honest. It, it, I call it the grunge lisp. You'd have to listen to it, but... Um, 
Kurt Cobain did it correctly, because he sounds nice and lovely, and he's he's a lovely person. But Eddie Vedder kind of sounds like if uh, Kurt Cobain uh, huffed, like, three hours. I wouldn't really think that Pearl Jam is as edgy as, like, other grunge bands. They, like, they he huffed ethanol and said, you know what? I'm going to go shred my vocal cords on a wood chipper. And then there's Eddie Vedder. That's ironic. Have you heard of Sentence Apprentice? No. That's the, I think that's like one of his songs where he like just screams a lot. But we're not talking about Nirvana. We're talking about Pearl Jam here, okay? And the reason why I think that Pearl Jam is unique from all the other uh, grunge bands is because when it comes to sound, they feel a lot more, uh, say, not as edgy as other ones. Like, you know how, like, of course Nirvana is like the edgiest one out there, or something like Alice in Chains, where it feels very grimy and dirty, you know? Yeah, their whole thing is dirty and grimy and disgusting. Yeah, they're aesthetic at least. But when it comes to Pearl Jam, they more focus on uh, the aspects that, hey, even though we're very popular and we're kind of uh, uh, really trying not to freak out, you know, because they didn't really see 10 kind of blowing up as it did, you know? At and least it addressed bullying with Jeremy. I wouldn't really call it bullying. I would I would really call it about... I would really call Jeremy about a kid who was kind of going through a very hard time with his parents. Especially his parents because it's... It, it, Eddie says in the song that he was just kind of ignored by everybody around him and nobody really cared about him or loved him in any way whatsoever. Because, like, I think the... I think it's worse to have nothing than something bad, you know? Like, like for example, you get to a job and you're like, oh, uh, I'm only getting like three bucks an hour, but at least it's better than nothing. Um, being utterly alone is worse than having someone who hates you. Because at least you have something to wake up to. Yeah. Jeremy, he got nothing. Nobody cared about him. You know, he was kind of... Just that one kid that would sit in the corner and just kind of draw by himself, I guess. And he was very mentally ill, even though most of the students saw him as kind of like a quiet kid, you know? And you may think that, oh, it's just a song about, you know, like, school shooting? Not particularly, not really. But what he describes in the song is that, at some cases, uh, he seems to kind of be this like, boiling, volcanic pool of lava, just getting ready to explode. Extremely edgy. Yes, like, I know. damn, bro, if you touch him, you cut your wrist. He's so edgy. And, um, so what Jeremy does is that this actually happened, like, the same year that this album came out, back in 91, where there was a student where, uh, he brought a gun to school and, like, nobody even knew about it, right? And he arrives class late, and the teacher's like, you know, whatever, you're going to detention, whatever. So he goes into the locker room near the gym, pulls out the gun, and like, hides it somewhere, and comes back to his classroom, and he says, I actually went to get what I really want, and he just shoots himself in the head in front of like, all of these kids. And this is portrayed like in a music video, which was very controversial at the time, because right after that video came out, I think another shooting happened? after that music video came out, and did people just blame Pearl Jam. All, all, all the Christian conservatives were like, It's the damn music in the video game! It's that darned grunge band not that our, inspired our, the kid to uh, shoot the school. It's not our awful parenting, it's the damn grunge bands. Gotta nuke them all. Yeah, so after that, it didn't really get much attention after like the event itself happened. But when Eddie Vedder looked at it, like, at the very corner of the page, you know, like, yeah, that's, that, that makes sense, you know, a kid kills himself, just maybe put in, like, a few lines and then in the corner of the newspaper, whatever, it's, it's nothing, it's nothing wrong about freaking out, guys, alright? So now Eddie Vedder's like, you know what, this is very tragic to read about, and I'm so surprised that it only has about, like, what, maybe a few lines in, like, a single segment in the newspaper? I'm gonna write a song about it. It's like, oh, look at the Kardashians and how much money in they have. Oh, in, in earlier news, someone shot themselves. But let's get back to this cat and his wacky adventures. Yeah, exactly. That's how the news works. It's just mundane 
shit for people who don't have lives, and the important stuff is kind of swept under the rug. And it's really sad, so I yeah. do give Pearl Jam some respect there. Eddie can't sing for, da for a damn, but he can in absolutely write a song. Yeah, and I think he doesn't... I think half of the time he writes the songs, and the other half, I think it's Jeff Mint that writes the other half of the songs. And the storytelling is really spot on in this track, Jeremy. It kind of felt to me like The Wall. A little if bit. If The Wall was condensed into one song. Kind of, yeah. And it's just him, like... Um, like, it doesn't really... like You know how in most music videos, you see the band playing, like, all the band members with the guitar and the drums? No, in this music video, it's just Eddie Vedder sitting down, and he's like, I'm gonna tell you a story. Like, the tone feels like that, you know? Now this is a story all about <laughs> how my life Please got don't. flipped or upside down. Please don't. Please don't. And it's just... It's very atmospheric, because it really... Has the, like the howling vocals and the guitars, like, uh, like the whole entire thing is just so great, you know. Everything except the vocals, that is, because the vocals are bad. Because Eddie Vedder doesn't know how to, like, he can sing, but he doesn't know how to chill with the grunge lisp. Because Kurt knew when to put the lisp in and when not to. But Eddie was just like, fuck it. I think a lot of post sponge artists really try to like rip off uh, like Eddie Vedder's uh, Eddie Vedder's vocal range. Like for example, uh, the dude from Creed, he's like a worse version of like any grunge band out there, especially Pearl Jam. Yeah, I will say this: Creed is worse than any Pearl Jam song I've listened to. Sorry, Creed, we're not covering you. And uh, another uh, song that I want to talk about is a few songs that most people won't really recognize, but may have heard, like uh, like Garden, where it kind of has that very slow tempo, and uh, very slow uh, tempoed song. It kind of has Did you say very tempo. <laughs> I know I'm stuttering. I'm slow tempo pilot. I am not good at this, <laughs> and it kind of has that very soft, melancholic riffs in the background, and you can kind of hear them whispering throughout the verses, and then when the choruses hit, it feels like a howl in the night, you know? Well, we've heard Mason Gush on uh, one song from this whole album, so how about we move on No, to I don't want to move on yet. Fine. You know, because how can we forget about Black? And it, how can we forget about Black? I, I I don't know how we can forget about the worst song on the album. It's would, pretty unforgettable. I would I wouldn't really call it the worst one. I wouldn't call any of those songs on here like bad. Black you know? Black like presented an atmosphere and did nothing with it. It's like ooh. It's about first relationships, you know? And Oh, I know something about that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I know how, how many, those work. How many girlfriends have we had? Let's not talk about this like on the air. Or something? I don't know. Let's not so, talk about this on the air. So when it comes to Sound with Black, I think the reason why it's the most popular song is because almost everybody can really relate to it when it comes to the lyrics. Like, we already know that it's about first relationships, and it kind of really hurts you after that first breakup. And it really does give you that experience like, hey, Love isn't all, like, fun and games, and it's not all great and positive. There's a lot of <laughs> things that affect you negatively as well. Oh, oh I, I think I know a little something about that, Mason. I thought you didn't want to talk about your relationship. Yes, no, but, yeah, I, I, okay, now that I know that Black is about this, yeah, I give it a little bit more credit. I think I understand a little bit more. Because you relate to it? Yeah. Too bad I can't relate to it, because I'm still a... Oh, you don't want to relate to the song, <laughs> Mason. You don't I, want to. Well, I, I guess so, you know. Because you do because you do think that relationships are uh, kind of overrated. They are. Right. But then again, I'm like a stupid kid. And it's I think it's also one of the most progressive songs as well. It's like the more you get into it, the more uh, the more uh, filled space that is in the courses. And how they're chanting at the end of the song and it keeps it, like the crescendo just keeps getting louder and louder and it like you can feel his like emotions after the breakup and or anybody in that matter and it's just such a great song okay if you want to listen to this album 
Uh, definitely uh, do it like on all order. Don't just like do it in shuffle or something. Yeah. Um, I don't like this song, but I get where it's coming for. And again, mad respect to our boy for knowing how to write a song. Uh, all he has to do is learn how to sing it, and it'll take him a couple... It'll take him two more albums to learn how to do that, but we'll, we'll stay tuned. And it's pretty obvious that it's their most popular song, and yet Pearl Jam's like, nah, we're not gonna do a single or music music, because they're just one of those bands that are, like, completely overwhelmed by, like, the popularity they were getting. Which goes on to their next album, Versus, from, uh... I believe it was 1983. Or, if you're a normie like me, it's the one with the sheep caught in the net. Or the chain fence, or whatever. And I think the huge difference is between 10 and Versus, is that it has a lot more looser and rawer sound. Like, overall. Did you, did you say raw or raw-er? raw -er. That's not a word, Obviously. I don't think. I'm not sure. More raw? And, um, and the thing about this album is that usually... When it comes to um, albums and what singles they release, it's usually like the most accessible one for a band, the most mainstream ones. That, but no, when they when Pro Jam releases singles, sometimes they usually kind of take the in between song, between like the songs that are very catchy and very emotional, to songs that are like okay, I guess it's just kind of in between, you know. And I think uh, that's why it goes the. Uh, uh, the lead singles of the things. Same for um, the songs like uh, what's another single they put out? I think it was Daughter. Daughter, yeah. Daughter is good. Yeah, Daughter is pretty good. And see, this is when I started enjoying Pearl Jam. Around here, there was like two or three songs that weren't Garbo, and that I could actually like have fun listening to. And that never happened to me in the first album, so I gotta give Versus some credit, it's an improvement. Not by much, but it's an improvement. They, they, they had some better songs in this one. And they did try to like promote like the least catchiest songs for this album, but it just, it just turns out that they kind of failed at that. Because they were really trying to be like, we don't want to be famous, we didn't want all this attention, all of our privacy is being broken. I didn't ask for this. I didn't ask for this at all. Please, <laughs> take me home. It, we should do the same thing if we ever become a popular YouTube channel. We should just try to demonetize all of our videos. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, this is non-profit after all. Oh, every video we've done except for our latest, The Foo Fighters, has been demonetized. It's great. And uh, I'm just going to talk about the highlighted songs that I think are the most uh, interesting to talk about. And one that I really want to talk about is Daughter. And it's one of those very acoustic songs that uh, is very melodic. But I think why I think this has to be one of the most depressing songs lyrically is because it's about this girl who has a learning disability. And they even like, like he even says in the song that he's trying to make her, he's trying to make the parents proud and learn all the things because it's kind of implied that the squirrel's parents aren't really that rich and they're kind of poor. So God damn, I identify with Pearl Jam songs a lot more than I thought I would. Yeah, like uh and she's trying she's trying so hard to learn all these things that they're teaching, but like she has a learning disability and she just can't really absorb it all. So, at first, parents just think that she's just being uh, edgy or angsty, and no, I don't want to learn all of this, you know? Uh, but they uh, didn't really know that she had this learning disability. God damn. Okay, I didn't know uh, all of Mace's these Pearl Jam songs, but, like, I identify with all the ones Mason's given an So the parents to. proceed to, quote unquote, close the windows down so the neighbors can't see, and just starts beating her every time she doesn't get, like, a lesson right just because she has a learning disability that she cannot control whatsoever. Dang. And it's just so depressing, God. Like, the, like the song itself is, like, accessible, but, like, the lyric is like, oh, God, I hate parents like this. You know? Let's move on to something. Something, uh, that's, something that's a lot more, uh... But don't worry about the girl. Because things will get better soon. And now it's not completely confirmed, but the song Rearview Mirror, as I believe, and everybody else believes, most people, is actually a sequel to Daughter, and here's why. First of all, uh, in the first few lines, uh, Eddie Vedder says, Beatings, 
made me wise, maybe, kind of. You know, but then the protagonist starts to realize, wait a minute, my parents were awful. Just terrible, I wasn't being misbehaved, I, I, I wasn't doing all this stuff for a bad reason. But they just didn't understand my disability. So I'm just gonna drive far away and just move on with my life, even though I just realized that I didn't really know that I had a learning disability until now, at least when it comes to the girl's perspective, and she's not all grown up, you know? Well, dang, I, I keep identifying It's a song about catharsis. You know, that's exactly what I plan to do when I grow up. Doesn't and everybody plan to just leave me, girl? I know, leave but... all the problems, but they just keep on coming back? But if you leave your state, you're absolutely screwed, because if you run out of money and you're not near your parents, that you're homeless. You're done. You've, you've been boofed. And it's just... It, it's just glad that at least, like... At least in our perspective as the audience, the girl is completely fine now, and she's just... She, she's she's moving on. You know, she's a full-grown woman now. And the next Pearl, Jam, the, nest. the next Pearl Jam album, they make a song called Roadkill about a girl who gets run over by a car. <laughs> <laughs> I, <laughs> oh, wow, Kyle. Oh, dear. <laughs> and uh, apparently... After they, uh, after they were done recording the song, Eddie did not like the song at all because he felt that it was too catchy, especially with the choruses. So do you know what he did? What? He basically took one of the drums that was already broken, got into his car, rode all the way to like the edge of a cliff or something, and just out of frustration, just I don't know, just chucks the drum. Off of like a cliff or a large hill or He's something. He's like, dang it, we're too good. <laughs> we're too famous. We're too good at this. But it's understandable, you know? Because it's like the DJ Khaled meme struggling from success. He, he, he flat out just does not like this song, you know? And for songs that don't really have that much of a deep meaning and they're very straightforward, one of them is Elderly Woman Behind a Counter in a Small Town. The title is very long, because when 10 first came out, a lot of people were like, wow, these title tracks are very like short and they're like only one word. But then Pearl Jam was like, you know what, whatever, let's just put it like a, like a long Are title. Is Pearl Jam just straight up trying to kill their success? They're like, let kind it of, die. Kind of, we'll, we'll get to that later. Uh, elderly Woman Behind a Small... Small... Small. Elderly women behind a counter in a small town. <laughs> I keep I keep struggling with that. You keep struggling with words in general. Man. Yeah, I know. And I think this song is um, a very... It's, it's basically a staple in their live shows because it's very easy to remember. I barely remember this song. It's, it's the one that goes... Hearts and thoughts, they fade with the acoustic guitar. Oh, I remember that one. Oh my God, it's been so long, you know. I think it's about maybe about an old woman who's been in that town for basically her whole life, and she's trying to really get out. But for some reason, she's just too attracted to the town, and she basically knows everything. Just remember, it's, it's like a more, small. It's a small town. It's like Duang. It's when like you live Mario. in a small town, you basically know almost everybody. What a beautiful Duang shoe. And I think. This old woman kind of meets this friend who's been out of her life for a very long time, you know. And maybe, maybe I should finally leave this town. You know, so it's a pretty, pretty simple con uh, concept. And then there's some more uh, political songs. Oh, great! You know how much um, I hate political songs. And one of these songs is "Glorified G," where they talk about gun violence and police brutality against black people, because... This is when it actually existed, instead of now when it doesn't. And, um, this song was inspired to be written due to an incident that happened outside of the studio, where police officers were basically, um, like, uh, threatening to shoot this black guy. It's like that one scene in Jojo Part 2, know? with the two cops And Eddie Vedder actually tried to convince him, like, hey, what did you do, you know? I, I forgot what why they were threatening to shoot him, but he just wanted to because remember, Eddie Vedder and most of the band members were activists. I mean, they still are, and they really do try to do uh, the most that they can do, you know. And 
uh, especially with their songwriting. So, another component why they wrote the song, besides the incident, is because I think the drummer came in, and he's like, Hey guys, guess what I got? What'd you get? I bought two guns! And he was like, proud of it or something? And the whole band was like, whoa, why, why are you like, proud of it? Like, you bought two guns. Okay, you can kill people. Alright, that's something to be proud of. So that's another component why they wrote this song. Well, guns aren't that bad. They're pretty badass. Like, if you ever see that one episode of It's Always Sunny where Danny DeVito sells all the guns? Oh, yeah. It's pretty rad. <laughs> I think that's, like, one of America's, like, true stereotypes that we love guns so I much. do love guns. Guns don't kill people. Uh-huh. <laughs> I kill people. Well, guns don't kill people. People kill people. So With overall, guns. <laughs> so overall, Versus, uh, they wanted to do something that's a bit more authentic. Like, you know how uh, some artists are like, you know what, this sounds a bit too overproduced. Let's let's make something that's a lot more, um, quote-unquote, homemade and not homemade. I mean, like, using a lot less expensive equipment, stuff like that. So overall, Versus, I wouldn't really say that it's better or worse. I think it's kind of a tie when it comes to quality. Um, I think it's better because I didn't like Black. So, their next album was the thing that really broke the camel's back when it came to their uh, struggles with fame and fortune. My favorite album that they made! Vitalogy, which was released back in 94, I believe. And... Yep, 94. 94, and it was about some... had influences from Kurt Cobain's suicide. Yeah. Kind of? A little bit, right? Yeah, it did. Oh, yeah, it did. And now, when it comes to sound overall, Vitalogy has more of a punk attitude in most songs. And it had Better Man, so of course it was good. Better Man was originally supposed to be like an outtake to the album, uh, which was recorded back in the Versus sessions. Oh, shoot, I forgot. I wanted to do something. Uh, uh, we have a special guest. Today. All right, one of them. My dog, Heidi. Say hi. Well, don't put it too close. Okay. Uh, my dog didn't say anything, but she's here. She's adorable. Anyway, get back to... So anyway, overall, it has more of a punk attitude. Like, for example, in the um, in the song Spin the Black Circle, it has that more of a fast tempo, it's kind of screaming a little bit, you know? Great drum beats. Because it, it makes sense, because grunge is literally just like... A um, rock. kind of a mix between punk rock, rock but and sharper. heavy metal, just kind of mushed that, together. That's why people uh, sometimes mistake uh, the Rattachi Leaf Peppers for being grunge, even though they're punk rock. Because no, they're punk rock. Okay, Mason. What are these darn terminologies? I can't uh, know. He's like, that I don't know about Mason. Oh, it's up. it's actually progressive funk, stop pop, um, this, new wave, this super is metal, punk hardcore. All right, do your research. It, this is this is actually um, super wave dog metal, uh, new, and new wave punk oh. progressive. Oh, <laughs> okay. <laughs> Ma Mason's so fat he just broke my chair again. So <laughs> good job, Mason. You did it. Uh, all right. So back to the album itself. Um, the lack of guitar solos on this thing, I don't really mind because they 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 were doing something different. And I think they really did succeed on that. Uh, like, for example, uh, the song Better Man uh, has more of a... Uh, like, I think they were doing more songs that were very weird when it comes to context. Um, and Better Man isn't one of those, but I think one of those is definitely the closing track, which was called Stupid Mop or something. Um. And it was just a recording of, um, like, of... A child talking to uh, a mental nurse in some sort of, like, mental facility. And I think this was taken back when Eddie Vedder was, like, about 17 and he, like, recorded it for some reason. I think it just... I think he thought that it sounded cool or edgy, I guess. You know? And I think... And the reason why the girls in, in Mental Asylum and Stupid Mob is because, for some reason, she likes pain. She likes to get beat, I guess. Dang, that sounds like someone we know, but let's not talk about masochist assholes. 
But then there's Let's other songs that are a lot good more songs accessible. Like, like Better Man. Like Better Man, but we already talked about that. Or Tremor Christ. No, oh, Tremor Christ is a good one. Uh, Tremor Christ, uh, I don't really know the meaning of the song, but it has more of a, uh, more of a melancholic a tone than any of the other songs on here, because most, like, most of the songs in there are, like, very, like, out there, like, you know? Wait, when was this album released? 94. Oh, uh, okay. And, Silence. And, <laughs> I know. Tremor Christ, uh... You can see how we don't rehearse any of this. We just kind of talk out of our ass with notes. We've always done that. Yeah. We want to have a more organic feel because, you know, we, we don't want to be too overproduced. Like, just like Pearl Jam didn't want to be too overproduced with a lot of their songs. And speaking of being overproduced, <laughs> um, let's move on to the next album. But there's a few more things I want to talk about. Fine. Have you seen the packaging for the CD? Yeah. Or no. It's actually really cool. It's because um, if you look at the cover art itself, it kind of looks like a book, right? If you get like the special edition version or something like that, it actually opens up like a book and it has like, pages for the booklet and everything. It's really cool because it has like it represents an actual old medical book with like anatomy photos and outdated information about the human body and. Um, and it all, I think it also has, like, a lot of weird moments in the booklet. Like, for example, usually you would see the lyrics in the booklet of an album. But, like, but there's, I think there's this one page where it's just, like, a picture of, like, Eddie Vedder's teeth in an x-ray. Instead of the lyrics for Corduroy. That's weird. I don't know why they did that. But it's, it's abstract. It's, I like it. Well, it's definitely weird. And speaking of Corduroy, this is a very interesting one. Because the backstory behind this song is that there was this one time where Eddie Betty was... Eddie Betty. Eddie, Eddie Betty. Eddie Betty. Eddie Betty was uh, going shopping one day, and he saw a corduroy vest. And do you know what the tag was? What? Pearl Jam, Eddie Vedder, the corduroy vest that was like 50 bucks. Meanwhile, the original corduroy vest that he wore in one of the tours in one of his concerts was only about, like, what, 15, 10 bucks? And that really made him think, like, wow, people are, like, trying to sort of make a buck off of us and who we are as, like, artists. And that what made him really, um, want to write this song, you know? Like, like, it's kind of like, sort of a letter to the fans. You know, like, I can't take what you can't give, you know? It's, it's very like, interesting. Like, I'm not special without you. Like, hey, he's just saying to the fans, hey, I'm just some dude who, like, make songs about political and social things, you know? So just don't treat me like a god or something. Especially you people who are trying to bank off of us. People trying to buy Eddie Betty... Ed Eddie Betty... You rubbed up on me. People trying to buy <laughs> Eddie Vedder Gamer Girl P. So, did you like this album? You said this was your favorite, right? It was. It was good. I like the cover art. I like, I like the songs. There's a couple songs I still don't like, but... It was the best Pearl Jam album I've listened to. Uh, and even for someone who doesn't like Pearl Jam, I gotta admit, made some good music in this album, man. But speaking of not good music, that was a horrible transition. Let's move on to No Code, because I have no clue why someone would make this, uh, this album. I wouldn't really say that any of their albums are, like, bad. No I Code would. was a, like a far departure from their first three albums, because their first three albums were like very grungy. This album kind of sort of takes a step back and incorporates elements of uh, hints of garage rock and art rock, maybe a little bit of blues rock and like Red Mosquito or something. And it represented a deliberate break from Ten Stadium sound, favoring experimental ballads and noisy garage rock songs. And it stood out with its emphasis on subtle harmony, like Off He Goes, or Eastern Influences. You can actually hear them like playing bongos in some um, tracks, or like um, very Eastern uh, Asian drums or something. I'm, 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 sure, I'm not sure. And this is an even more uh, attempt to kill Pearl Jam's popularity. Yeah, definitely. Or switching genres, kind of. Because... Yeah. A a they did that on purpose. Eddie Vetti was like, wow. No, not just him. The, the whole entire band was like, 
getting sick of all of this, you know? Wowie, how can we kill our popularity while still making music? How about we change genres? Look how it looked, uh, look how it worked for, uh, Linkin Park ten years in the future. Wow, that's pretty shitty, let's do that. And then there's songs- And it didn't work. And then there's, like, songs that are kind of spoken word, like, I'm open. Uh, and then there's, uh, tri- oh, sorry, I did- I wouldn't really say Asian drum sounds, but more tribal. Like, who you are in my tree. It kinda sounds like Tusk. A little bit, yeah. From, uh, Fleetwood Mac. Yeah. Which is my eighth favorite song of all time, by the way. Listen to it, please. Red Mosquito is one that really stands out to me. Because it has, like, more of a blues rock feel. Especially with the guitar riffs on here. Yeah, uh, anything named Mosquito instantly I hate because, uh... Mosquitoes just want to eat my ass all the time. They're the only creatures in the world that want to suck me at this point in time. And I'm not okay with it. I've lost more blood to mosquitoes than I have to any grave injury. I think this is during the time... I think this, I think this song was inspired by the time where Eddie Vedder had to, like, like, legitimately leave a show, like, right in the middle because he apparently had the stomach flu or something. I'm not sure. Toughen up, dude. Remember when uh, Dave Gruel broke his leg and was like, yeah, I'll still play? Oh, yeah, I remember that. Yeah, this guy, this guy's... Not going on because of the flu. I don't what, feel so good, man. What, I'm gonna what a leave. little bitch. What a little bitch Eddie Vedder is. I think he wanted to leave that um, stage anyway. I'm not sure. <laughs> that was Dave Rule. He probably would have punched himself in the gut and said, Yeah, let's keep going. <laughs> Fight me. <laughs> so Red Mosquito kind of has that sort of... like. Whenever I hear the song, it kind of has that swaying motion, if that really makes sense. The red mosquito not to leave the it you know was, how, you know I would how, love the song if it wasn't like You know where I'm mosquito. going at? Yes. Right? And then there's very uh very like very calm songs, even for their standards up at this point, like Who You Are and um What's another song that was very calm on here? Um Mankind. Mankind was one and I think another one has to be off He Goes, which is another song that I really like. Yeah, some of these Pearl Jam songs, you can already tell, like, once you're hearing them, that you've heard it before. Although like, I think the only problem I have with the uh, album as a whole is that the track listing felt a little bit inconsistent compared to other song and compared to other albums. I would say this is the one album that they made where you can just put it on shop and it'll make as much sense like, as Like, all the tones didn't. are kind of... But, like, all the tones of the tracks felt kind of messy. Like, one point, there's, like, very uplifting songs, like, In My Tree, and then the next song is... And then, like, once you know, and there's, like, a very slow ballad. And there's Smile, and then off he goes. It's really weird. And the band would not yield in their, uh, advances to try yeah. to ruin their own popularity. Yeah, and definitely. Speaking of not yielding, let's move on to yield. Oh, that, that was the best. That was the best transition we've ever done. Fire words coming from the studio. Even wait, hold on. There's a few more things I want to talk about uh, about No Code. Even some people back then thought that this was a very weak album compared to the first three. Mason, you already spent like 20 minutes on 10 alone. We, we got to keep up the pace. Yeah, I know, I know, but just one more thing, okay? Um, and it just felt a lot more um, positive in tone when it came to this album, except for one uh, song. And it does have a backstory, looking. And if you don't know, this is a very weird one when it comes to the lyrics. Because, because they, were, they were still at this uh, phase where they were kind of uh, nervous about being overpopular. But of course they didn't really need to worry about that now at this point in time, because yeah, No Code just kind of topped, but then after like maybe two weeks, it just it dropped really hard. They're like, finally! Finally! We aren't that popular anymore, I guess. We can go back to being a niche band. Except that this song, Lookin', is about this one time where I was stalked by a very mentally ill girl. Not girl, I should say woman. Who would like, run up to him and like, tell him that she was her husband and like, she killed her children or something? I don't know, it was weird. It was, yeah. Suffering from success. Yeah, suffering from success. Not just stalkers, either. 
I think that's it when it comes to no code. Yay, we can move on to yield, because Mason will not yield in the words that he that come out of his mouth. 1998. All the time. So, welcome to yield. I like the album art for this. You can already tell that it's just like a picture that an amateur photographer took, and it's just like organic. It's like the feeling of the show. It's organic. What if there was a yield sign in a street where you don't have to yield very deep, I know. I'm 14, and this is deep. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, the lyrical content is very similar to No Code, where they're trying to, like, sort of take a step back from the usual lyrics that are about fame and the lack of privacy and stuff like this, because after No Code, they were feeling a lot more comfortable in their shoes when making music and kind of sort of putting themselves out there. Because at this point, grunge as a whole was just dying down a lot. They're like, finally, now that we don't have to change genres, and our genre is already dying, we could be unpopular again. Yay! We can be experimental. It's like the opposite problem that King Crimson had. King Crimson was like, oh shoot, we gotta move on to the next genre, we gotta be new wave now. No, we gotta go back to our roots. Pearl Jam's like, okay, how can we kill ourselves in the most effective manner? How can we just end our po mainstream popularity at this point? <laughs> how can I kill myself? I mean, they did that with no code, but with the Yield, they want to um, do a lot more hard blocking record. They're trying to tell the music industry, stop. Stop putting us on the top charts. We don't want it. Go away. They were getting kind of tired with the whole grunge thing, you know? So they did make more hard blocking record, but it was more of a um, more of a non-grunge hard rock record, if you know what I mean. Hard rock was already on the decline after Saint Anger happened, so... This is 98, Connor. Saint Anger didn't even happen until 2003. <clears throat> I'm a stupid. I'm a dumb. I'm an absolute buffoon. Do the Evolution. Have you seen the uh, video to that one? No. It was, I think this was uh, made by Seth, uh, Seth McFarlane, who was... Ooh, good. I yeah. love Okay, I don't like Family Guy because it's disgusting. Not Seth. Wait, is it? Not Seth. It was um. I think it was the guy who animated for. Uh, I'm not Seth MacFarlane. It was some other dude. It was like the guy who animated for Scooby Doo. Oh well, that's definitely not Seth MacFarlane. <laughs> I, I keep getting. My, uh, yeah, that was cringy. No, God. Seth MacFarlane made Family Guy. Who animated for Scooby Doo then? I don't. Not the original, but like, um, the, one of the reboots. The live action one? No, not the live action one. It was, uh, the modern ones. I don't at know. The, at that time, I'm not sure. You mean the, the same guy who animated the, um, the music video for Porn's Freak on a Leash. And it's, uh, animated, and of course, the songs about mankind in general. Where we kind of get overexposed by our egotistical ways, like, hey, we're humans. We're the best thing on this entire earth, even though we're like the worst thing ever. We're like the best parasite. We're all gonna die out thing. soon, okay? That's oh, I can't fact. wait. I can't wait till the meteor just curls down. That's what I'll find. I can't you. wait. It just. I can't wait for the end of the world. The end of the world keeps on getting delayed, Kyle. Oh. Yeah, it got postponed in 2011 with that one preacher guy. It got postponed in uh, 2015 when everybody thought the world was gonna end. Yeah, um, it's like Tool. They won't stop delaying what we all want. <laughs> Thanks, God. God's new album, Extinction's coming out. 2020. I'm calling it. Yeah, Do the Evolution has to be like their most heaviest um, songs, you know, because he's like, oh, yeah, Do the Evolution. All that voice crack. Yeah! <laughs> yeah! He, yeah. He, I think he screams a lot more on that track, too. Which is fitting, I guess, because it's because it's very chaotic. Just in general, talking about how humanity sucks. Just humans suck in general. Okay, you can't deny it. Oh, we all suck. You can tell how much we suck by just listening to this podcast and how unrehearsed and unprepared we are. And it's all right. It's fine. We're better. We're not a reaction channel. We, so we, we know. At least we aren't that. And then there's really atmospheric um, songs like "Given the Fly." Where it kind of sounds like something you would hear off of like their first three records, uh, especially when it comes to uh, just things that are like very uplifting, you know, uh, like it, like there's there's the howling vocals again, and 
It's, it's just a good song. It's a good song. Though. So it's like one of their best non-grunge. This band reminds me of In- this band reminds me of Incubus, not in the way you think. Because How? when when we started the thing for this show, uh, the show, wh- the the formula we've been following is Mason will pick a band, I'll pick a band, and we decide on a band together. And the two bands that Mason's picked so far in our line have been Incubus and Pearl Jam. And they both seem to me like... A mixed bag? No, no. I liked Incubus after a while. In- Incub- it's grown on you? Incubus grew on me. Pearl Jam didn't. It, it didn't, huh? That, that's that's all right, you per- know? Pearl Jam was rubber and Incubus was glue. So overall, what do you think of Yield? Um, it needs to yield and stop, because I liked, like, two songs. Like, like yeah, even though, it, in, at least in my personal opinion, Yield is a bit more, um... It was better than 10, in my opinion. It was a bit more, um, consistent compared to No Code. But when it comes to sound, um, it's decent, uh, in most cases. But when it hits, it hits pretty good. Um, so... Yeah, I'm, I'm pretty much done with Yield. It's a decent record. So Let's like no move code. on from Yield. On to, I think the next is... Uh, Binaural. Binaural. I thought this one is very interesting. My dyslexia told me that this was named Burial. <laughs> but it isn't. It, oh yeah, it's the one with Breakfall. Okay, yeah, I remember this one. Like, that's, <laughs> it's the one with Breakfall. That's, that's, your, that's a Binaural view? Yes. This one I really want to talk about. Okay, I'm gonna let Mason just spill. Go ahead. Alright, so Binaural, this one is a very interesting one. And the reason why it's interesting is because this one is a far, far departure than any of their other albums of this part. Even more than No Code. And because of one single thing. It is extremely atmospheric and very moody. To the point where it's like their least heaviest album so far. And the reason why it's called Binaural is because it uses this thing called the, the Binaural Recording Technique. Do you, do you know what that is, Carl? I have no clue what that is, but I'm assuming that it is a double mic recording thing. Buy. Yes. Yes! Oh, I, I am the big brain. That is a 1000 IQ move I just That's did. only part of the t- technique itself. Shoot. So what they did for this album is that they got a mannequin head, right? Like this, is a ma- uh, no, this sounds weird. Trust me. They got a mannequin head and they put it on a stand, and they put microphones on each of the ends of the mannequin head, and they will record around the room. And so it could really so when you put on here here headphones on and like monotone, it really does feel like you can hear the instruments all around you instead of just straight through your ears. And it has more of a 3D stereo sound sensation for the listener of actually being in the room. You know? It was multifacet cool. on headphones before multifacet was a thing. It's really cool, okay? I wish that more artists would do something like this. The well, Gorillas for... did this. Oh, they did? I'm pretty sure. Hmm. Because if you listen to any of their songs from the Now Now, it, it sounds exactly like that. We should really do the Gorillas one day. Yeah. Although, the yeah, we're getting off topic. Back to Binaural. This is a really cool thing, but for some reason, not all of the tracks use this technique. I don't know why they only did it for like half of the album, and then like the other half of the song, it was kind of the regular old sound. At least when it comes to production and how they recorded it. Uh, and so when they were doing this album, they want to sort of challenge listeners to really go out of their boundary and instead of listening to hard rocking songs, put more of a moodier, more atmospheric tone. It did remind me of Morning View from Incubus and how they kind of just slowed down. And how they did this is that the first three tracks on here kind of has this like uh, very traditional rock feel, uh, especially with Breaker Fall. So they could really give the listener something that's uh, more familiar at this point. And then, Light Years comes on, and then the listener's like, wow, this is like very different. 
it because was definitely unique. It, it's a, it's a transition. It's a transitional track. You know, it kind of has some elements of traditional rock, but also some space rock. Yes, that is an actual subgenre of rock. Space rock. Yes. Does a uh, David Bowie Space Oddity fit in that? I guess. I haven't listened to it yet. What do you mean you haven't listened to it? Look, I can't listen to every album in the world, okay? Oh my god, it's David Bowie, Mason. That's like saying, oh yeah, I've never listened to Nirvana. <laughs> no, ne never <laughs> listened to uh, Red Hot Chili Peppers. What do you, what, who are those? What's the Foo Fighters? Shut up, Mason. It's so a oh. light years. It's a pretty good transitional uh, track. Don't worry, everybody who's angry in the comment section, I will make sure Mason listens to I, David I will. Bowie after I will. this video. And then it goes into the next track, Nothing as it seems, and it is so like layered when it comes to the recording and the production and how much it echoes. Some people have compared it to something that would be made by Pink Floyd, and it, it there's a good reason why they chose this song to be uh, the lead single to Ben Roll because, like it, like I don't know, it, it's just very echoey, you know. If you are going to listen to this album, please wear headphones, okay? I know that not all the songs use this technique, but please trust me, it, it, it's worth it. It's all an right? enhance to the experience. Now next- And I think this um, track kind of talks about him kind of looking back at his childhood, I guess. Um, growing up in Minnesota for a few years. I'm not sure, but... I think it does kind of reflect the sound, I guess. And then there's songs like Insignificance, where it's one of those very rare instances where the instrumentals are the most memorable part instead of the vocals. I like Rival. Rival. That's one that I want to talk about. Uh, Rival was actually inspired by the shooting, the Columbine shooting. Okay, what's with the, all the Pearl Jam songs talking about shootings? What's wrong with talking about very hard subjects in music? I don't know, but it, it does seem like Pearl Jam has a ban guns agenda, which doesn't really fix or solve anything. They're pretty political. They're very... Yeah, but still, banning guns doesn't fix or solve anything. They didn't, they didn't really say that they would ban guns, but it's just kind of one of those songs that kind of uh, talks about how we kind of look at violence as some sort of uh, form of entertainment when we're not really in the violence itself. Like for example, like nowadays, whenever there's like a school shooting, yeah, maybe it'll get like a Twitter hashtag or something like that. And it's, maybe like a few articles here and there. You know what causes these school shootings? It's those darn first person shooters. It's the halos, it's the in it's those grunge bands too, it's Pearl Jam. Made by the <laughs> devil. Made by the devil. <laughs> you know, so it's just so weird that no matter what, I have a feeling that we will always see violence as kind of a form of entertainment. Like you know how like in movies and in video games and in news outlets you know, and you're just sitting there like, Oh my, what a terrible tragedy. I'm just gonna do nothing and sit here and watch the violence commence. Yeah, or commit the violence if you play video games like me. I can't tell you the amount of innocent people I've slaughtered in a Fallout game. But, <laughs> that's beside the point. If you could kill children in Fallout games, let me tell you, I'd have the infanticide perk in a second. All right, three more songs on I'll talk about. I'm gonna go to the next one. I, I know, oh my God. I know that you're getting very, uh, very impatient, Kyle. But I already showed you of the girl before we recorded this episode, right? You did. Yeah. This, even though this song is about about three minutes long, not that long, it is very underrated. All right, like most of these songs on here are very underrated. Okay. Very hypnotic. Okay. Because it kind of has that, like, creeping up, singing like this in a very um, monotone, but also very um, focused manner. And you can even hear, like, uh, the band members, like, prepping their instruments, you know? Like, maybe tuning the guitar a little bit in the beginning. They're like know? C418, where they yeah, just kind of... Yeah, like, kinda... prepping. Prep. And they really did want to give you that sense that, they, that you were in the room with them. And it feels like that. And... 
Uh, there, you can even hear like some sound effects in, like over, under the layer of the guitar. Did you hear the cuckoo clock in that song? I heard no. a cuckoo. I heard a cuckoo clock in like in my right ear, which was very weird. I think they wanted to sort of hide that in there, you know. So yeah, of the girl is just so. Oh, it's underrated. Okay, let's let's come on, let's move on. Are you sure? So, I actually wanted to talk about Riot Act for a second. You know why? Because I didn't listen to it. What you didn't? All right, I'll just keep talking about binaural then. But no, no, no. Okay, so I I got so bored listening to Pearl Jam. By the time I was done with binaural and I listened to the first song of Riot Act, I was like, okay. I'll break up the monotony. I'll listen to some actual good music. I listen to some gorillas and the band. Pearl Jam just is a new thing, and that's fine. And then I accidentally ended up listening to two hours worth of music. And uh, by that time, uh, it was the it was the day of the video, so I listened to the self-titled Backscraper and Lightning Bolt. But I, I forgot Riot Act even existed. <laughs> <laughs> I don't blame you. I'm not really a huge fan of Riot Act, you know? So you don't like Riot Act? Riot Act... There was still... Okay, so 2002, Riot Act, right? They were still in that kind of mindset of like, Hey, it's not the 90s anymore, okay? We can't be quirky anymore and we gotta be very mature and stuff. <laughs> right? And that and Binaural did that pretty well. I really like Binaural. But Riot Act, think of it as like an alternate version of Binaural, but without the atmospheric mood, and it's just them kind of like because like most of the tracks on here are like very acoustic. Does it have that early two thousands stank? Kind of, mm, kind of a little bit, I guess. Um, but there are only a few songs I really do remember uh, out of my head. Uh, like for example, I even though. I'm not a huge fan of this album. I think it's just okay, I guess. All right. Mm. I still do like the lead single to this thing, "I Am Mine," which kind of has that like folk rock vibe. Another thing I want to talk about is that I they still have rock. that art rock thing they did with uh, Binaural, but they also did a lot of traditional folk rock elements. I love folk rock, song. and you will learn such a thing in our next episode. The lyrics on the song are just so poetic. Like, I'm 14, and this is deep. <laughs> <laughs> this is deep. We're teenagers, and this is deep, guys, okay? So, I am, like, for example, one of the lines is, Yoshim is focus, everyone is crying. The clock is on the mind is to thinking of what okay, the clock Ma Mason, is time. Mason, people aren't here to listen to you, so. Yeah, I know. It's just an example that I want to talk about. I really enjoyed this I don't think that Mike even picked that up, Mason, because you were singing so quietly. Exactly. Aren't I, like, the loudest person on this podcast? You are the loudest person. I if you go to the, our earlier videos when we didn't actually have any good mics, and we recorded off of uh, some old Xbox gaming headsets I had lying around, you'll see that... Uh, Mason, it looks like he's deep throating the mic. But what he's <laughs> actually doing is he can just talk like, for so long and so loud. I don't know if you've really um, uh, heard this, guys, but I kind of have this habit where I talk too loud and I don't really realize it. So, and then he says what he was going to say under his breath, and it's really creepy. And when we first became friends, I thought he was a psychopath. <laughs> That's why I bullied you in fifth grade. <laughs> <laughs> and now we're best friends. Yay! Thumbs up. No, Yay! Thumbs up. We're making a music podcast. No. So back to Riot Act. I kind of don't really blame you for skipping this yeah, one. Yeah, I didn't listen to it. Uh, I think the only thing that you're really missing out is like, I am mine and maybe Save You. Save You is just one of those very decent songs where it talks about trying to help out a friend of addiction or any other problem that might be facing in life, you know? Yeah, I have, a, I have a ton of friends who wait, and that's not cool, so we try to get them off that, so I can... I, I can really identify with the Pearl Jam songs, but I can't listen to them. Also, I think another thing that, um, that you won't really like is the political tone of this record. Another political album. The only good political album ever made 
was either the band's first album or Eat the Elephant. Those are, those are like some of the only two good ones. Bush Leader, I think, is about George W. Bush. There was this one um, the performance during the Riot Act tour where Eddie Vedder basically had like a mask of uh, George W. Bush. You know, kind of like mocking him a little bit. Okay. And then he took off the mask and like just just threw the microphone. And a lot of people got mad at that. All of like the Bush supporters at that time were like booing him and like throwing things. It was like, oh boy. Okay. You know, Eddie Vedder needs to chill. Sorry, no, no. Uh, Betty Edder. What, what did you call it earlier? Eddie Vetty. <laughs> Eddie. Eddie Vetty. Whittle Eddie Vetty ran up the hill. But, uh, yeah, he needs to chill. He's too political. I don't like politics. If you're political, that's fine. You know? At least he does it in a very, uh... Don't talk about your politics here. here I'm not. We're here to talk about music, rock and roll, and, uh, Little Eddie Betty. We we, we have nicknames for the, the lead singers. We have the Little Drummer Boy, and we have Eddie Betty. And I think there's also a song about a very tragic event that happened during the tour of the previous album that I wanted to talk about during the binaural section, but you wouldn't let me. So I'm going to talk about it now since they made a song about it. No, no. Whatever. So they made a song about what happened during the binaural tour. I'm going to go away for a minute. The final concert of the European tour ended in just a, just a huge mess. Uh, it happened at the Rock Slide Festival in Denmark where on June 30th, where... Nine fans were basically crushed to death, underfoot, and suffocated to death as the crowd was rushing towards the front of the stage in one of their in one of their performances. And they had to like cancel like what? Um, how many shows did they cancel? I think about like three more, four more shows after that. Oh, I left because I don't want to hear about this. Mason and a lot of people them. blamed Pearl Jam for the death of those nine people for some reason. It was that damn grunge band, not the <laughs> who actually killed them. It's the video games. It's the it's the music. I don't it, think it's anybody's fault. It's I from think. the devil. From the devil. I think it's just people getting a bit too over the top and being too excited in the audience. And they were very depressed, and they were like, "Oh my god, did we like accidentally lead to like nine people's deaths?" So they made a song about that, and I think that, and yeah, I think there's a reason why Riot Act is so like somber and depressing because this was like what a year after 9/11. So yeah, like this whole album is just like oozing with like negative energy, but with some hints of hope, I guess, with some glimmers. And I think that's it when it comes to Riot Act. Um, at least when it comes to the topic of the sound itself. Can I come back? Yes. Yay! I have returned from my slumber. You have too much of a small attention span, though. No, I have uh, too much of a bullshit detector. <laughs> and it was it was really firing up when we were talking about that. So, let's actually move on. The, okay, so, the next album, the self-titled... Uh, was the one with the avocado. The avocado one, yes. People, a lot of people will call this the avocado album, so we're just gonna call it that, because why not? The white album, white album, black album, avocado. Also, guacamole is like one of the best sauces ever. I'm just gonna say that right oh, now. Oh, guacamole fucking sucks. But, okay, never mind. This one I liked a lot more. I liked this one because it was kind of a return to their roots. Like, in the promotional videos, have you seen their promo? stuff, they said that, oh, we want to go back to what really made us popular in the first place with their first Oh, albums. now they want to be popular. Okay. No, they don't want to be popular. Like, of course they aren't, like, mainstream anymore. They, like, the last time they were mainstream was back when, like, Vitalogy was released. Okay? Rock isn't mainstream. I mean, it's still alive, you know, but it's not mainstream in the public view, at least. But they just wanted to go back to making hard rocking, like, traditional rock. You know, that are a lot more aggressive, and yeah. Which is, um, portrayed by most of the tracks on here. Especially when tracks like 
Will Bite Suicide, where he goes back to those skirting vocals. Uh, which is about... Uh, it's here somewhere. Uh, Will Bite Suicide describes the anger against the Iraq War. Yes, it's still political. Of course it is. But don't worry. It'll it'll end soon, pal. Just, just carry on. You gotta wait for Lightning Bolt? Just, just, just carry on, okay? It's still political. Carry on my are... way. And I have to admit, I'm not, guys. I'm not a political person either, you know. But it's it's still a good music, nonetheless. I like it a lot more than this. Is right the video that to... turned us into a politics channel? It's not politics. It's beyond a politics channel. Oh, okay, don't worry. Don't worry, guys. Uh, like worldwide suicide, where it was about the Iraq War and the death of American soldier Pat Tillman, which uh, he was famously killed. From the friendly fire. Do you know what that is? Friendly fire? That's when you shoot your teammate. I played enough Halo to. On accident, yeah. I played enough Siege to know what Or you accidentally fire kill, like, the person on your side. Yeah. So he was, like, really mad about that. And in the promo video, they said that, oh, we're gonna go back to our roots with albums like 10. Um, I think this sounds like more of stuff from Yield than 10. You know? Because, remember when I said that 10 was, like, over the top when it came to its tone? Well, I see a lot more, um, like, think of Yield and their self-titled album as being, like, two sides at the same point. Is that this one feels a lot more modern, you know? What do you think about this album? Well, I will say that I didn't hate it. It's not as bad as 10. It's not as bad as Versus. They've gotten a lot better. I like their later stuff, and Worldwide Suicide's a good song. Same goes for Life Wasted, um, which is, I think it's about at one time where uh, one of the band members was um, driving from home from like a funeral, and kind of talking about like all of like the time that you wasted and all of the procrastination that people have done, you know? Did you say procrastination? Yes. Definitely. That sounds like a song in itself. Procrastination. That's a that's a uh, album. That's it's an album title. It's the new Pearl Jam album. Procrastination. <laughs> Life wasted. I really enjoyed. Uh, same goes for very, uh, very hard rocking songs like Comatose, and then there's really calm songs like Parachutes. And Parachutes is is an acoustic track. Uh, with a like more lighter tone and vocals, you know, not like in uh, volume, but more of like, um, what, what's it called? I forgot. Lighter, like he's singing like this about parachutes, but he still in has pitch. that awful grunge lisp. They they dropped the grunge a long time ago. He okay. still has the lisp. And then there's, uh, and then there's really, uh, long songs that are very overarching, like Unemployable and Inside Job. So yeah, overall, I think this is more of a, um, like, think of it as, like, Yield 2, basically. Why not just call it Yield 2? Yield 2 Electric because Boogaloo. for some reason, originally, they wanted to call it, like, uh, Super unowned. <laughs> like they wanted to make a like a pun off one of Soundgarden's albums for some reason. They're like, nah. Let's They're just like, call it Pearl a, Jam. A good grunge band. How about we try that? Let's just call it Pearl Jam. They said, you know. Well, we've almost uh, are at our closing because their second to last album is up next. Backspacer. Backspacer from two thousand nine. This one. Um, fortunately, is a lot less political. I was still wa watching Pokemon Let's Plays in 2009. I was watching cheesy old 2008-2009 YouTube poops back then. Yeah. <laughs> Look what it turned us into today. Yeah, yes. So, Backspace, what do you think of this one? It's the one with Just Breathe. <laughs> I have nothing else to say. I was looking at the track listing when I was uh, listening to Backspace on Amazon Music. Yes, I listen to Amazon Music. I have a Spotify, but whatever. What's the Nerd, what's, what's I have the Apple Music. Ne what's the difference? Come on, play The difference is I have class. And this one felt a little bit tamer overall compared to your self-titled. 
Yeah. Uh, I think it's mainly because they want to sort of take a break from being very negative, angry, and, ah, you know, when it comes to the Eddie Vetti be angry. And the, uh, and the songwriting. And so they want to take more of an optimistic approach. Uh, like, for example, The Fixer, where they want to do a lot more accessible approach. Because they want to sort of make sure that, oh, if we do a bunch of, like, hooks and things that you can easily hum to, you know, maybe it'll kind of, um, it'll kind of go out there, I guess. Like, The Fixer, where there's, like, a lot of yeah yeahs and the woe woes. Hey, yeah. You know how, like, most music is like, yeah, yeah, whoa, whoa. There's actually a term for that. Do you know what it's called? Yeah. Do you know what that's called? What? It's called the Millennial Award. It sounds like Michael Jackson. <laughs> <laughs> and they try to do that, you know, and it's, it's a good song. It's easy to digest, easy to swallow. Uh, Just Breathe and Amongst the Waves are ones that feel uh, a bit... that feel very short. But also kind of has that more relaxing vibe. Like, like yeah, this has to be like their shortest album ever. Like, when I first listened to this album, I'm like, wait, that's it? Okay, I guess. And I think the only problem I have with Backspacer is that it's way too short. Alright? And when, I, when it comes to how I feel about this album, um, it's... I, I, I didn't like it as much as things like their self-titled or um, Yield. But it's still one of those albums where they want to go back to basics, like very basic. And I think the reason why they encouraged the more positive mood is because of the election of Barack Obama. Yeah, this this song was during the Obama administration. That's how old it is. It's not that old. But then again, it's like 10 years old now. And this is the second to last album by Kyle. This is the second to last one. And it's 10 years old at this point. It's pretty funny. Yeah, at this point, they were like, really slowing down. They're the old men production. now. We're old. How old is the members of Pearl Jam right now? Like, like at least like in their 50s at this point. Yeah, they got nothing on King Crimson. The, the literal skeletons that walk up on stage and start singing. And one thing that I find interesting, like one of the few things I found interesting about this is that Tracks like Just Breathe and The End contain, like, violins and a lot of, like, orchestral instruments. Didn't you see that? Did you say orchestral? It's orchestral. Orchestral, whatever. Did you did you hear all of those orchestral instruments? Orchestral. orchestral. Yes, I did. Yes, uh, yeah, that's... It's it's pretty interesting, you know? Because usually there'd be, like, a lot of bricks and stuff. But this one felt a lot more traditional. Accessible. Easy to swallow. If you're into more of a poppy, more of a pop rock thing, I think this is a pretty good album for you. But personally, for me, um, say, like, the same goes for Riot Act, I just thought it was just okay. You know, overall. They would not make another album until 2013, which was like, how many years? When was their... Like, four years later? Lightning Bolt. This one is a lot more hard-hitting, don't you think? Yeah. What do you, what do you think of Lightning Bolt? I barely listened to it. You didn't listen to Lightning Bolt? I did, I barely. I listened to The Getaway, Sirens, uh, Pendulum, Swallowed Hole, Lightning Bolt, My Father's Son, and Mind Your Manners. And it was... it was pretty good. It I was, liked it. I liked Lightning Bolt. It was their second best album in my opinion. By this point, I was emotionally drained. I don't like Pearl Jam. The pe people can say anything they PJ? want about little PJ. People can say whatever they want about this song. I mean, about this show. But you can't say that we haven't made sacrifices because I had to listen to this bullshit. Let it, guys. If you're gonna like do some sort of comment, if you even are going to comment, let them have opinions. Okay. Let my man's live. Let let him live. Okay. But whatever, go ahead. My Come. public crucifixion will be in ten years. Put a hate comment. Whatever. So lightning bolt. It features a lot more longer songs compared to backspacer, which is one of the. Um, I already told you this, but backspacer seriously, it was like way too short. So it's a lot more longer in length. More um, longer. 
it kind of goes back to the social issues that was um that was featured on that were featured your grammar is like a uh, I'm broken it goes back to social issues and politics political aspects a little bit just a little bit though but it also mixes in songs about aging and mortality because at this point Pearl Jam has been around for like 20 years now and they were like old. They like wow chill. I'm like super old and you can really see this back in my day uh, in songs like Slipping by Myself in Future Days uh, where at this point he has his family, he has a daughter you know and at this point he's just kind of questioning whether or not like like, what path should I really take at this point, you know? I'm considered a legend. This whole band is considered to be a legend and one of the greatest uh, 90s bands of all time. Like, it doesn't really matter what we do at this point, because at the inter inter because in the internet age, like, we're all, we're all kind of just separated in these bubbles. You know, like, they're, like there's, like, you, be you can basically just search up, like, a forum and just sort of talk about whatever you like, you know? Like, you could basically look, like, find people who are into the same things that you are, you know, in the modern internet age. It's a good send-off to Pearl Jam, which, even though I didn't like, is... It's definitely... I can see why people did like it. And even at their lowest points, like Riot Act, they still... Like, I thought Riot Act was okay, and okay isn't bad. I would at least put their worst album at, like, C tier, you know what I mean? At least it's not one more light. Yeah, but there are some hard rocking songs here that are a lot more aggressive, especially uh, with the first two tracks, Get Away and Mind Your Manners, which uh, criticize organized religion. Yes, uh, my favorite. Uh, the Get Away, I think the difference between Get Away and Mind Your Manners is that uh, Get Away is more about the aspects of how people use religion for their own personal gain. Like, there are, like, there are some... People who only do this for money, and the and by some you mean most, most people who are like preachers and stuff do it for just money. And then I think um, Mind Your Manners is about people who um, follow this religion, and yet they don't really consider it by heart, you know, and they don't really uh, do all of the things that the religion really tells us to, like, you know, and Mind that, Your Manners. And by that we mean every Christian, because if... Any Christian I knew actually listened to the Bible. They'd stone women to death and not eat oysters or wear linen, linen clothes. So, yeah, th this album brought up some pretty good points religiously that I can agree with. And then there's like really uh, mellow songs up here that kind of reminds me of the more atmospheric tracks that you hear on something like uh, not binaural, but something that you would hear off of like. E yeah, maybe binaural, but without like all of the quirky techniques they made. I liked binaural more because it had like a uniqueness to it. There are a lot of ties when it comes to my personal opinion on these albums, you know. Pendulum, whenever I hear this song, it kind of paints a picture of my head of the game Journey for some reason, and I don't know why. Just a person walking through a desert with a bunch of ruins, I guess. Yeah, don't play Journey unless you like Gris, or like really boring games where you just walk. I wouldn't call it a game, I would call it like a piece of art, you know? So, at this point, uh, Pearl Jam has kind of taken a break, like a really long break, because it's been about, what, si like six years since Lightning Bolt? And nothing has ever been released after Lightning Bolt until just last year with the new single that came out called Can't Deny Me. And I was looking through, like, the comments on that video, and people complaining like, oh my god, it's too political, blah, blah, blah. Because if you see the single art, it's it's uh, basically about a woman holding up a sign, and there's a bunch of uh, people protesting about something. And oh boy, uh, those people are dumb, because they were political. They've always been very... political. Yes, exactly. Literally since their first album, they've been political. Yes, exactly. You know, and um, it's a decent single, can't deny me. Uh, but the weird thing is that I know that some albums, like, they release a single, and then a year later, uh, they kind of at least announce something, or they release the actual album that the single's in. But for some reason, they haven't said anything. 
we're halfway into 2019, and they haven't really said anything other than, yeah, don't worry guys, it's going to happen. And I think the only thing that we really know about their newest album is that it can, it's going to contain a lot of shelved songs that they're going to uh, use on other albums, other previous albums that they haven't, like a lot of unfinished stuff, basically, that they're finishing just now. It's, it's a decent song, you know? Uh, yeah. Overall, Pearl Jam. They're a pretty legendary no. band when it comes to the grunge scene. They're definitely not for me. And th that's kind of ironic because I think the next band we're going to do, I don't think next one's going to like it, but... Hey, we, you may we, never know. We branch out. And let me tell you, next time we come to you, you're going to feel like you're in a goddamn log cabin. <laughs> Stay tuned. <laughs> so yeah, we'll, we'll see you later, guys.